Mr. Richard Koo, thank you very much for joining us. Firstly, let's talk about the theme of the conference then. The theme is called Changing of the Guard. Mm -hmm. How would you frame the debate going on here? Is this the right way of looking at it, the rise of Asia over the uh, West? Well, the fact that this, place, this conference is taking place in Hong Kong suggests that it's East-West way of uh, looking at it. But I like to look at it in a different way because the INET, which is the other organizer of this conference, has this idea that the old way of thinking has to give away to the new way of thinking in understanding what's happening around the world. And I think this new way of thinking is beginning to make itself known. For example, Chairman Bernanke of the Federal Reserve used to champion this idea that monetary policy can solve all the problems. And that has dominated economic, academic economic thinking for the last 20 years, all the way until around 2008. And even after the crash, Jeremy Bernanke used to say, after about a year into the crash, he said, OK, the fiscal policy has done its job. Monetary policy can take over. And that's the, basically the old way of thinking. That it, Maybe short-term temporary fiscal policy, but not a long one. What is he saying now? He's now saying, don't fall off the fiscal cliff. Fiscal cliff is basically a fiscal policy, which means don't cut your budget deficit right now. And the United States is running a budget deficit, $1 trillion a year, 7-8% of GDP. Everybody should be worried about the size of the deficit and that need to cut it, raise taxes, cut spending. But the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Chairman Bernanke, <clears throat> who used to make that argument, is now saying, no, you don't cut now. If you cut, the whole thing will come crashing down. This is new thinking. Why is chairman of the Federal Reserve saying, we, even with this massive budget deficit, don't cut now? This was not in economic thinking before. And I think he's beginning to realize that this is a very different disease, very different recession, and needs to be treated differently. And I'm really glad in that sense that the concern that I was expressing all along with the Japanese economy, because Japan was in the same uh, uh, shoe not too long ago, uh, is now being reflected in U.S. policy uh, thinking. So this is, in my view, the, the new, new part of the economic thinking. And this should be a long-term view, in your opinion? Is this what should set the tone from now on, this, way, this new way of thinking? Well, this new way of thinking, in my view, is what was missing all along. The old way of thinking, the private sector is maximizing profits, if you let them lose, they'll do all the right things and everything will be fine. That's the old way of thinking. But the new way of thinking, in addition to this, is that, yes, most of the time, this old way of thinking is correct. But once every several decades, private sector goes crazy and they en end up forming a bubble, and people think they can make lots of money, quick money, uh, through leveraging up and so forth. And when the bubble bursts, asset prices collapse, all the borrowings remain, and they realize that their balance is underwater. And when their balance is underwater, what can you do? You're bankrupt, right? You have to pay down your debt. So that's the right thing to do. If, if, if I'm in that situation, of course, I have to pay down debt to fix my uh, financial house in order. But when everybody does it all at the same time, you enter a very different world that was never discussed in the old economics. And this new world, I call it balance sheet recession because there's no, no name for it in the, in the literature, so I had to come up with a name. Once you're in this situation, where private sector is all paying down debt at the same time, so you're paying down debt, I'm paying down debt. Everybody's paying down debt. That's the right thing to do at the micro level. But when everybody does it all at the same time, what happens to the macroeconomy? You know, in the macroeconomy, <clears throat> if someone is saving money or paying down debt, which is the same thing, you better have someone on the other side borrowing and spending money. And in the usual world, we have a financial sector in between, taking the money from the savers, giving it to someone who can use it. And there are too many borrowers for whatever savings there is. Interest rates are raised. Too few borrowers, interest rates are lowered to make sure that all the safe funds are borrowed and spent. That's the function of the financial sector. But we have a situation in the United States, in the UK, large parts of Europe, still Japan. You bring interest rates down to zero and there's still nobody borrowing money. Everybody's paying down debt. Then what happens? All the safe funds come into the banking sector. All the deleveraged funds, pay, uh, the debt repayment, 
come into the banking sector, it can't leave because at zero interest rates, no one's borrowing money and you can't bring rates any lower because you're stuck in the situation. And the economy starts shrinking because the money is no longer being borrowed and spent. And the last time this happened in full force was the Great Depression in the United States from October 1929 onwards. Everybody was paying down debt. No one was borrowing money. Now, after that experience and uh, this idea that perhaps government should borrow money start coming up, and Japan actually fell into this 20 years ago. And Japanese government, at first, not knowing what they were doing, <coughs> simply wanted to you know, dole out some money, uh, did the fiscal stimulus, borrowing and spending money. But that actually worked beautifully because the private sector was deleveraging like mad. But the government was borrowing money and put that money back into the income stream. And so Japanese GDP actually never fell below the peak of the bubble in the entire 22 years that we have now. And this is against massive, absolutely massive private sector deleveraging and commercial real estate prices falling 87% nationwide, only 13% of the value remaining. And still, Japan's GDP never fell below the peak of the bubble because the government was borrowing and spending. Now, when I start making the argument that something like this can happen to, to any economy if people go crazy about the bubble and when it collapses, at first, no one took me seriously. And there was a denial, that something, like, something crazy like that can only happen in Japan. We are different, we are different. And even after the Lehman Brothers collapsed for the first year and a half or two years, people are still in a state of denial. No, no, it cannot happen. No, it cannot happen. But now they realize that it can happen. And this, kind of, this way of thinking, that if the entire private sector is deleveraging, minimizing debt instead of maximizing profits, then the government has to come in and borrow. And that's what Chairman Menenke is now trying to say. That yes, we have a $1 trillion budget deficit in the United States today, but this is no time to cut. If you cut the whole thing, it will come crashing down. And we actually, unfortunately, had that experience in Japan. 1997, so this is seven years after the bursting of the bubble. Uh, IMF, OECD, those, those people who understood nothing about Japan at that time, told Prime Minister Ryutaro Hashimoto that you are building bridges to nowhere, roads to nowhere, economy going nowhere, and then you have an aging population. You better cut your deficit. And I was already in various government committees advising prime ministers, and I said, no, 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 you don't cut now. If you cut the whole thing, will come crashing down. You know, I'm just a foreigner, not a private sector citizen, not even Japanese, and all these big shots from around the world, as well as in Japan, said, cut, cut, cut. So he did. Raise taxes and cut spending. We have five quarters of negative growth. At least that was how it was reported at that time. Complete breakdown in the banking system. Instead of budget deficit declining by 3% of GDP, it actually increased by 3% of GDP, and it took Japan 10 years to bring this thing back down. So when the private sector is minimizing debt, which happens maybe once every several decades, but if it do when it does happen, you have to change your thinking completely. And so <clears throat> what I'm offering as a new economic thinking here is that I'm not trying to replace the, the old way of thinking. Old way of thinking works on one condition, and that is that private sector balance sheets are clean, strong, presentable. If you have that world, then all the theories that they taught you in universities will work because private sector is forward-looking and you know, invisible hand works in the right direction. But once every several decades, that fundamental assumption is violated. The private sector does not have a clean balance sheets. They are minimizing debt instead of maximizing profits. Then you come out of this world completely. And we are in a world I call balance sheet recession. And in that world, we have to think differently. Let me uh, transport you to Japan then and take maybe your theory about this new economic thinking. Do you think that's a applicable to Japan and what's going on right now? In the light of what we've seen on Thursday, this $1.4 trillion injection into the economy, how does this all fit together? Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, I'm not particularly enthusiastic about what uh, Bank of Japan is trying to do now. Uh, 
Japanese balance sheets are repaired. There's no question about it. After 15, 20 years of debt repayment, a very diligent debt repayment, of course your balance sheets will be repaired by then. What's left in Japan is a trauma toward debt. You go through debt repayment for 5, 10, 15 years until finally your balance sheet is balanced again. You're no longer in a negative uh, equity territory. You become so sick of borrowing money. It says, I never want to borrow money again, never again, never want to see bankers again. And that's exactly what happened to the Americans after the Great Depression. In, during the Great Depression, income fell to half. GDP collapsed by half, and the people had to pay down debt with half the income. Now, you can imagine what a horrible experience that was. So the Americans who lived through the Great Depression never borrowed money until they died because the trauma was so strong. Now, Japan has a mini version of that, and that is that, as I said, Japanese GDP never fell below the peak of the bubble. So the income was still there because the government kept it up with fiscal stimulus. But still, this was a very long process, paying down debt. So now, even with the lowest interest rates in human history, very willing bankers, because they're stuck with this money, no one's borrowing money because of the trauma. And so we have to really address this trauma. And in the U.S. case, uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember, until 1985, all interest payments were basically tax deductible, whether it's uh, auto loans, student loans, whatever, uh, credit card loans, they're all tax deductible to encourage Americans to borrow. Of course, then they borrowed too much, destroyed the world one more time, 2008. But Japan needs that kind of policy to get people to borrow money because the trauma is the real issue, in my view, because balance sheets are already repaired, interest rates are already so low, bankers are already so willing, but the demand is not there. Now, how would this Bank of Japan action fit into this thing? Well, Bank of Japan is saying, we're going to massively increase monetary base, even though interest rates already are zero. Now, it's like you have you know, 100 apples shown on your, your fruit stand and people are not buying. So then you say, okay, 200. Still no one's coming to buy. Okay, we'll make it 1,000, 2,000. Those 2,000 apples are shown, but people are still not coming to buy because the price hasn't changed yet. And price cannot be changed because interest rate is already at zero. And so this idea of quantitative easing, which is of course tried in the US, in the UK, UK massively actually, uh, still are not producing the results that some of those proponents are looking for. I mean, in the case of UK, UK did the largest quantitative easing in history, at the Bank of England. And the Bank of Japan is basically trying to catch up with Bank of England. That's all there is to it. Where is the UK economy today? still in double dip, or some people call it triple dip. And UK has a positive inflation rate, negative real interest rates, and still the economy is doing so poorly. United States, with the large, one of the largest quantitative easing in history, and even with a relatively large fiscal stimulus, unemployment rate still in the 7% range, latest uh, employment figures, 88,000 or so, very disappointing. Now, all of those are, I think, an indication that you cannot rely on this method, this quantitative easing, because you really cannot change the price because the price is already at, at zero. And if people are still not borrowing money at zero, then you better do something about the fact that they are not borrowing. And I wish uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe would come up with uh, measures to address that issue by increasing incentives for companies to borrow like uh, accelerated depreciation allowances, investment tax credits. I think those are the areas they should really put their effort on, not on the monetary side. Mm -hmm. But you know, this is a fairly recent phenomenon for, for the world. I mean, Japan has lived through this for, for 20 years, but for the outside world, you know, after the Lehman collapse, this is still only four, four and a half years. And there's still a lot of people out there who don't realize that this is a different disease and get very excited when central bank does something. So every time, for example, U.S. announces quantitative easing, stock market goes up 
uh, people get excited. But after a while, the enthusiasm kind of goes down again. And then the Fed does something, and then it goes up again. Uh, you know, so as someone said, buy on the rumor, sell on the fact. The market tends to operate like that. But the real issue is the real economy. If the real economy is not really strongly picking up, then you have to start thinking about some other measures. And I really commend Chairman Bernanke for that reason, that he realizes all, all of this mechanism. And that's why he's saying, don't cut the fiscal stimulus now. Now, within Japan, there are quite a few people who understand what I just uh, told you. And there are some in, in Abe administration who understand it as well. But there's also another group who believed in the old idea, the old economics. And the old economics, the one that Chairman Benenke actually championed as an academic 10 years ago, just print money and something should happen. These people wanted Bank of Japan to try that. And so it is trying. I, I wish them luck, because now that they decided to do it, it better succeed. Uh, I think it can succeed it cannot succeed through, uh, I would say, the logical route, in a sense that if people are still traumatized toward debt, you add all these apples on the uh, shelves, it's not going to change much. But if you do enough exhortation, that inflation is just around the corner, careful, inflation is coming, inflation is coming, if you say this enough times, as someone said, you know, if you tell a lie hundred times, people believe it. If you do it enough times, you know, television, elsewhere, in a morning program, you turn on the TV, and the people are talking about inflation, uh, picking up this and that, then housewives, including my wife, start saying, is inflation coming? Shall we buy something quickly? You know, when something like that happens, through exhortation, maybe this will work. But it has to work through that channel, not the, not the ordinary channel because ordinary channel is actually blocked, and it's been blocked for years for a different set of reasons, what I call trauma toward debt. And this, they haven't addressed this issue yet, so they're doing it through, basically, my view, exhortation. Let me pick up on your idea that the Japanese people are traumatized into not spending. But isn't this what Abe's trying to do? He's trying to inject confidence into the real economy so that people go out and spend. Um, I read a recent McKinsey report where millions of people in Indonesia who are living on two dollars a day are very confident about the future and that's in stark contrast to Japan third largest economy in the world where people are not optimistic at all about their future economy isn't this what Abe is trying to do? Well if you can just do the exhortation and things all improve quickly like that well we don't need too many economists do we? <coughs> uh, there's a reason why people are pessimistic, not pessimistic, are traumatized, because of the crazy bubble that they ended up having. <coughs> we should have avoided the bubble to begin with, but you know, bubbles happen with, always with a good set of reasons, and then they go overboard, and then the bubble crash, and we go through this very long period. I mean, Americans, I don't think, are particularly optimistic today either. The British, Spanish, I don't think these people are very optimistic either because of the problem they face. Huge uh, balance sheet problems, years of their repayment, and when you come out, I think US, UK, Spain, they all face the same problem that Japan is facing right now. So Indonesia never had to face something like this, so people are optimistic, that's fine. But once every several decades when something like this happened, then you face this problem. Now, against this, <coughs> uh, some of Bank of Japan's people uh, and people like Adia Turner are saying, just monetize the debt. If the government just borrows, the uh, government issues the bond, central bank buys it, that means people don't have to buy it, people don't have to pay back, so they don't, they worry, don't, they don't worry about the future tax liabilities, they feel better about themselves, start spending money, then everything will be fine. You know, there's this argument. Well, I'm not happy with that either because what's missing in Japan, what's missing in the US or UK or Spain are not lenders. 
money is available massively. Everybody's saving money. No one's borrowing money, right? So private sector is flooded with cash for savings. That's why all these economies are in recessions. Adding a central bank as another lender, when the private sector already cannot find enough borrowers, will just make the competition among lenders even worse without making the situation better because the bottleneck is on the borrower's side, not on the lender's side. And so Bank of Japan coming in, start buying Japanese government bonds, corporate bonds, uh, some shares, whatever. It's just adding one more lender into an already overcrowded field when the problem is really the lack of borrowers. And in order to increase the lack of borrowers, you, uh, uh, the kind of proposals that I'm suggesting that, okay, let's give them incentives. Uh, investment tax credit, on the kind of uh, program that President Obama put in for 2011. If you invest during 2011, you can write off everything dur during 2011. That kind of package is what Japan really needs. I mean, if you are giving that much up incentives to borrow and invest, and if you look really stupid not doing it, then some of the corporate executives may say, I really don't want to borrow, but gosh, if it's this interesting, maybe I should. And if they get over the trauma once by borrowing and it, the result turned out to be okay, then it's not a trauma anymore, right? So I think those are the areas where people should uh, put more emphasis on instead of just printing money, put the money into the system. This is, in my view, still the old way of thinking. The new way of thinking should recognize the fact that it's the lack of borrowers that's the key, this, uh, key bottleneck, and they should start hitting these problems in a pinpoint way. I know that you're lecturing around the world on the lessons learned from Japan right. and how the Eurozone can learn from Japan. And you said previously that um, years ago no one was listening to you. Are people listening to you now? Uh, I was invited to Germany six times last year. Five of them in Berlin, one in Frankfurt. Uh, one, was, one had to do with INET, but I think German people are beginning to find that their version of the world is not exactly what's happening around them. But this idea that <coughs> there's a new disease in town called ba balance sheet recession is still very foreign to them. Within, within the U.S., a lot of people have read my book, including the chairman of the Federal Reserve, a lot of people at the White House. So this concept of balance sheet recession is now fairly well understood in the U.S., some in the U.K., especially in the financial sector. But in continental Europe, very little recognition that this is actually a different disease. Private sector is minimizing debt instead of maximizing profits, and therefore we have to think differently. That understanding is still very preliminary or elementary. Uh, but without this idea, I don't think we can understand Europe. And I say this because of the following. The problem, in my view, the European crisis started with year 2000, not 2008 or 2010. What happened in year 2000? There was a dot-com bubble. And many people don't recognize this, but German households, German companies went crazy about the dot-com bubble. The Germans are typically very cautious people. If they have nothing to worry about, they worry about the sky falling on them just like the Japanese, but I don't know why, but year 2000, these guys went crazy, absolutely crazy. And when the thing burst, suddenly Germans become extremely cautious, start saving money, stop borrowing money altogether, just like the Japanese uh, 10 years ago, and just like the Americans and, and the Brits now, after the bursting of the bubble, people stop borrowing money. Now. So because Germans stopped borrowing money altogether, German economy entered what I call balance sheet recession. The economy continued to do very poorly. And as I indicated to you earlier, in, in an environment like that, government has to borrow money because private sector is not borrowing money. You do monetary stimulus because no one's borrowing money. Nothing works. So the economy continued to weaken. And German government should have used fiscal stimulus, borrowing and spending money to keep the economy from collapsing. But it was the German government itself that put in this condition in the Maastricht Treaty saying government cannot increase budget deficit more than 3% of GDP. 
So if you're the German government and you put this condition in the Maastricht Treaty a few years earlier, you cannot say, well, I'm in a different condition. I have to borrow more than 3% of GDP. So they couldn't do it. Economy continued to weaken. And the European Central Bank, looking at the largest economy in Europe collapsing, brought interest rates down very low to 2% at the time, the lowest in post-war Europe. But Germany was still not responding because it was in balance sheet recession. No one's borrowing money. The economy continued to weaken. But all the peripheral countries who were not involved in the dot-com bubble, naturally, if you have a clean balance sheet and interest, it comes down to 2%. Of course, you borrow and spend, right? That's what's in the textbooks. So people are in Spain, Portugal, Ireland, all these places with relatively clean balance sheets says, wow, interest rates down to 2%. You'd be stupid not borrowing and investing in housing and so forth. So that's how the bubble began outside Germany. But in Germany, nothing happens. House prices kept on falling with the lowest interest rates in post-war Europe because everybody was paying down that no one was borrowing money. Now, when nobody's borrowing money, money supply cannot grow. Let me explain. Money supply, now how much money private sector gets to spend, is basically our bank accounts, right? I mean, there are some you know, paper money, coins, but those are very small portion of what is known as money supply. Vast majority of money supply is basically bank accounts. Now, what happens to this money supply when everybody starts paying down debt? all at the same time. How do you pay down debt? You withdraw your money from a bank and pay back to the bankers, right? Under ordinary circumstances, the bankers will take the money and lend to someone else. Then there's no reason for bank deposits to contract. But all the money is coming back to the bankers, and the bankers cannot lend this money because everybody's paying down debt at the, all at the same time. The money supply starts shrinking. Or it will be stopped growing as fast as it was in the past. That happened in Europe. So. With 2% interest rates, this very low interest rates, money supply in all the peripheral countries start growing very rapidly because everybody's borrowing and spending money, right? This is what you expect with, with monetary easing. But in Germany, money supply grew very, very slowly. Now, with money supply growing very, very slowly, naturally wages grow very slowly, prices go up very slowly. Whereas the rest of Europe, the prices go up as well, wages go up. Ten years later, they have this huge gap. They call it competitiveness gap. Now, whose fault is this gap? Did Southern Europeans, because they had a good beaches, nice weather, great food, and therefore they were lazy, and therefore they became uncompetitive? No. That's not the reason why they are uncompetitive relative to the Germans. It's because the German economy was in balance sheet recession. People are not borrowing money. Money supply didn't grow. Wages didn't grow. Prices didn't grow. But the rest, in order to save the German economy, because the ECB brought interest rates to such low levels to save the German economy, which was then called the sick man of Europe, the other guys were having this huge increase in money supply. And then they basically priced themselves out of the, against the Germans. Not against the rest of the world, necessarily, but against the Germans. And then you look at the German trade figures. Germany really came out of balance sheet recession by exporting its way out to the rest of the Eurozone. Not necessarily against uh, North America, not against Asia, but against the rest of Europe. That's how, and then finally, that bubble burst in the peripheral countries. That's where we are not in now. So in order to solve this European crisis, we have to have a measure where those countries in the Eurozone that are certified to be in balance sheet recession, meaning private sector not borrowing money at zero interest rates, they should be required to put in fiscal stimulus so that uh, the pressure will not be on the central bank to bring interest rates down to cause bubbles elsewhere. If German government put in the necessary fiscal stimulus year 2001, 2002, 2003, German economy would have done okay. And the ECB would not felt the, pr the pressure to bring interest rates down all the way to 2%. And if th they didn't bring interest rates down to 2%, the other economies would not have had a bubble, or certainly not to the size that they actually reached. Money supply wouldn't have grown so much. 
and the competitive net gap, competitiveness gap wouldn't have grown so large either. So all the problems come back to this fact that Maastricht Treaty was never really designed to handle balance sheet recession. So Mr. Richard Ku, you were talking just now about the Maastricht Treaty and how it wasn't designed to treat balance sheet recession. Right. <clears throat> when Maastricht Treaty was put together and signed in 2008, no one outside Japan have heard anything like balance sheet recession because economics profession has never discussed this possibility that private sector may be minimizing debt at near zero interest rates. So I can't blame them for not including this possibility. But I've been warning for the last 10 years. My very first book, 2003, warned that if US, UK, and Europe fell into, uh, uh, US, uh, UK, Japan, and Europe fell into balance sheet recession, Europe would do the worst because the Maastricht Treaty prevents them from taking the correct actions. I'm afraid that's exactly what's happening in Europe right now. So from my perspective, Maastricht Treaty is a defective treaty because it didn't consider one, this possibility of balance sheet recession. And I think they should urgently put that into the possibility by saying, under ordinary circumstances, governments are not supposed to run budget deficit more than 3% of GDP. But if you are in this certified to be in balance sheet recession, and it's not that difficult to certify, you can just check the flow of funds, see what the private sector as a group is doing. And if you see the private sector as a group is not borrowing money, actually saving money, at near zero interest rates, then you certify the economy to be in balance sheet recession. And in that case, and in that case only, government should be required, if not, I mean, encouraged may be a better word, but I would like to see that they require those economies to put in the necessary fiscal stimulus with the full support of the ECB, EU, so that the problem in that economy in the case of the German economy after the dot-com bubble, will be contained in that economy. So you won't screw up uh, policies and economies of other economies around the Eurozone. Because in the Eurozone, you only have one monetary po policy decided by ECB. But economies could be, you know, one in balance sheet recession, other one doing something else. And the adjustment is needed at the fiscal level because there's only one monetary policy. And this is extremely critical when an economy is in a balance sheet recession because balance sheet recession, you can only cure it with fiscal stimulus, not with monetary stimulus. And so for those economies that are in balance sheet recession, they should have a special provision in the treaty saying, okay, in that case, you put in a fiscal stimulus, we support you. And if that is in place, then the treaty can handle both situations, the ordinary situation and the balance sheet recession situations and I think Euro will, will operate more like a normal currency zone instead of having the kind of problems that they're facing right now. Mr. Richard Kuh of Nomura, thank you very much for joining us. Quite welcome, thank you. Thank you.